Welcome to Nostalgia, the pop culture podcast where we have deep conversations about superficial things. I'm your host, Nicole Tremaglio, and each week my guests and I deep dive on the parts of pop culture that made them who they are today. If you like the show, please follow, rate, and review on your platform of choice. Watch us on YouTube and Spotify, and subscribe to our super fun newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nostalgia. I'm super excited to have Chris here with me today. My guest just came out with a book. It is my favorite book at the moment, actually. It's called Where Are Your Boys Tonight? And it's all about our favorite time in history, which is the explosion of mainstream emo. So we're going to talk about all things emo, which is very exciting, I think, for the both of us. So welcome, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, it's a uh, day after release day. Yesterday was wild in a good way, and I could talk about this stuff and uh, just aughts culture in general and culture of now. I like to think I'm not uh, not too stuck in the aughts, maybe just a little bit, but I could talk about this stuff all day, and I feel like you kind of can too. And I, I can, and I do talk about it all day. Um, <laughs> you know what's really interesting? The concept of nostalgia first occurred to me during the pandemic because I think in the nostalgia niche, people are like, oh, were you like stuck in the past or living in the past or you wanted to fulfill something from your past that you couldn't back then, but you could now. And I'm like, actually, no to all of those things. I really just care about belonging and connection and music and pop culture is a way that does that for people. And so this concept of nostalgia or like liking something or having this affinity or affection towards something that reached the peak of its popularity before your coming of age, or maybe even before you were even born, this really became apparent to me. Maybe it might've been two years ago at this point, but I was standing in line at Target and I saw a young teenager behind me with a My Chemical Romance t-shirt on. And I was like, what? This kid was probably not even born when that album came out. And then like, here I am in my queen t-shirt and I was probably wearing my Fleetwood Mac t-shirt at the time. And you just realize that like, welcome to the black parade could be somebody's a night at the opera. And I actually really don't want to take that away from anyone. So thinking about it, like your book could be the meet me in the bathroom for someone. Do you ever think about that? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, after is straight up what inspired me to do the book. I mean, I was really into oral histories for a long time, but Meet Me in the Bathroom came out at a time. So I, I had I was a staff writer at Billboard then. This is uh, 2017 when Meet Me in the Bathroom came out. And I had been there for four years. I started on staff in 2013. Rock, alternative, the indie side of the music industry was my beat. So I had been there a few years and I wanted to start taking on more ambitious pieces. And I was starting to come to terms more with just owning what I was into in high school. So 2015 was the 10 year anniversary of Panic's debut album, Fever You Can't Sweat Out. And I interviewed Brendan Yuri, Pete Wentz, a bunch of other figures from that album for that. And it was really fun. The piece got a good reception. And a couple years later, when Warp Tour announced that it was doing its final run to play it out, I did a big oral history on the 2005 Warp Tour, which I highlight a lot in the book as kind of the breakout moment of this scene, like the 1977 for punk or the 91 for grunge. 2005 was the blow up point like it was bubbling for sure in the mainstream before 05 don't get me wrong but 05 and Warp Tour in particular because Baby Paramore and they were all like 15 16 were out on the tour that year and MCR and Fall Out Boy were exploding on TRL that summer so I did an oral history on that an article oral history for Billboard and that did really well and 
after I got laid off from Billboard uh, pandemic, a bunch of people got laid off in 2020, I was like, okay, what's next? I really wanted to do a book of oral history of this era. Wasn't really tenable when I was staff. Like I worked like 10 to 6 in the Billboard office in Times Square. Like that was, you know, my job. So doing a book like this, just like, you know, wasn't going to happen then. And uh, the day after I got laid off, you know, when when you lose your job, or at least especially in like media industry, when everyone is so online, everyone's sending you these messages of encouragement. It's obviously a, a horrible time for you personally. But then you're getting all, the, especially like like in the pandemic when the vibe, early, early on too, this was in April, when like no one really knew where things were going. So there was a lot of positivity back then. Hope there still is, but there definitely was a lot, a really sense of like trying to help people out. So uh, late afternoon, the day after I got laid off, I got this email and I saw Pete Wentz in the headline. I was like, okay, what's this? Right. Because <laughs> we had, we had interviewed each other, or I I'd interviewed him a bunch of times, but we had never emailed or anything like that before. We didn't tell each other like that, so. It was just like a quick like words of encouragement. Hey man, always liked your work. You know, stay in touch. So I was like, "What is this? Is someone fucking with me?" So I I texted Gabe Supporta, who I knew pretty well from doing some stuff with him at Billboard, and he was like, "Read me the email." And I said it, and he's like, "Oh no, that's Pete." And I was like, "Sick." So I reached out to Pete. I was like, "Yo, thanks so much." And that little email conversation next couple days turned into my first ask for the book and uh long story short here we are that's how it came that's really exciting to see how it all came together and I'm sure you didn't necessarily imagine like get email from Pete Wentz on my bingo card for (laughs) 2020 but like there it was and I I very much believe in kind of these synchronicities in timing where it's like you couldn't have written this book four years ago or five years ago everything unfolded exactly as it needed to and you know it tells some really interesting stories I think that something that you bring up too at the very beginning of the book is an acknowledgement of the fact that and I love looking at the past through a contemporary lens right and so this book does that because we can't look back at that time without recognizing that like it was a misogynistic and homophobic scene and you know certain actions done by people um you know it's not that we're condoning them but at the same time you can't look back without mentioning them and having to reconcile that kind of like moral dilemma i think that the internet exacerbates that as well um so I just appreciate that. And I think a question that I have for you just regarding emo and like the, cause of course no one at the time that that word wasn't a thing, but I'm curious if you feel like whether it's being in the scene or listening to the music requires in a way similar to punk requires some kind of alienation or frustration with mainstream culture or society because I think a lot about the manufacturing of subcultures and how all of these major labels were out there as you outline in the book and Fall Out Boy wanted to be huge and maybe earlier efforts were more underground um the I guess the whole concept of selling out which I've talked to all of my Gen X guests about that's kind of a part two of the question but yeah part one do you feel like there's a, a particular kind of person or that this music at some point, whether it was 2005 was the tipping point of like, it could really resonate with anyone? Yeah. Talking about like, you mentioned like alienation and like these themes of being an outsider that come up in punk rock, you know, so much of punk through the nineties and like, like important nineties punk bands stuff like Bad Religion and, like, you know, like, Fugazi was, you know, not an emo band, but, you know, so much of, like, held up as, you know, the pinnacle of DIY, you know, which it is, essentially. 
But yeah, so much of punk in the 90s and like hardcore in the 80s, what it was lashing out against was societal stuff. You know, it was about like American imperialism or like how fucked up the government is or, you know, racial inequality. It was social issues. And then so much of what changed with the bands in my book was I think a lot of the strife got turned inward. So much of emo is self-focused and a lot of the angst is being pointed at inner turmoil, you know, relationships, mental health, uh, relationship with your family. So early, I think early on when the stuff in my book was really connected still to the underground, to like DIY culture, leftist politics, zines, stuff like that. It really did feel like it was an important expression of like, fuck, like the punk scene is supposed to be so forward thinking, but we haven't like been able to express like inner pain where, you know, we've just been like yelling about Ronald Reagan or something. So I think for a lot of like the 90s screamo stuff and like some of the early breakthrough emo bands like Thursday, there was a connection between like socio-political stuff, but also personal turmoil. And I think that's why today, like, a band like Thursday just feels so unique and so important. But as it got more and more turned inward, and as the generations passed, and, well, we're talking about a couple generations here. This is kind of just between, like, the late 90s and the early 2000s I'm talking about here. As things got more and more self-focused, and then also as the scene became a lot more mainstream and you've got big time managers and major labels and MTV sniffing around and you've got the dollar signs being seen. I think things started to get a little bit dumbed down and that's when you start to get to more of like the the misogynistic shit and you, you get to, you know, those like kill my ex-girlfriend with the chainsaw type lyrics. The stuff that in some art, more tasteful, artful ways could have been, and like often was just like a healthy expression, you know, about mental health or just what you're going through in relationships. But as, as the scene got bigger and bigger and bigger, I think you start to see both the quality of the music get dulled down. And, you know, unfortunately I think that's part of how you sort of saw the unsavory stuff creep in. Yeah, something you mentioned, I actually think it was in the Billboard article that came out yesterday about you and your book, um, how music and the movement was no longer tethered to politics. And when it's so about the self, um, these people who, the Gen Xers who have gotten older, they feel alienated, they feel old. And I think that that's like a tale as old as time, right? Because now that's what millennials are experiencing with Gen Z. And again, the internet exacerbates all of the generational wars. But I find that very interesting. And I've always loved this music, but that was not how I outwardly represented myself. I'm curious about you. When you were in high school, when you were growing up, where did you kind of feel like you fit in? And the fact that you were from New Jersey too, which is like the capital, um, so many bands came out of that scene. You mentioned Jersey and Long Island. I'm from Connecticut, so there's really nothing like too sceny there in comparison, although the whole tri-state area, just I think having that familiarity of what that scene is like um, is cool. So I want to know from you like how how you feel like your expression of yourself at the time fit into the music and the culture that was around you. The high school I went to looking back was bizarre, but in the best way, because I couldn't have written this book if I didn't go to this high school. Uh, uh, Colonia High School, shout out. Uh, it's a big public high school in uh, northern part of New Jersey. And so... So I went to high school between 02 and 06. So Couriers is book. MCR, Thursday for sure, were already like local heroes. Midtown, plenty of others. Uh, some bands that like, when, when I was really starting to get involved with the scene, 
a bit in 03, especially in 04. Then, like, a band, like, Senses Fail, Armor for Sleep, Early November, Hidden in Plain View. That was the stuff that was really getting hyped as, like, the come-up stuff. But, yeah, it was totally normal for, like, preppy kids who wore Hollister to be really into, like, oh, my favorite band is Matchbook Romance. Like, that was, <laughs> that was, that was a normal person in my high school. Mm-hmm. So there was kind of a sense, looking back, of, like, we kind of are the cool kids. It wasn't, it, it wasn't like, oh, we're, like, the homecoming kings and queens of this school. There mm-hmm. still were, like, those normal, typical types. But, like, I remember, my, so... This is a cool story. My buddy Greg, who's still a good friend of mine, he played in this band called Moraine. He played synths in this band. They were, uh, they came close to signing to Drive Through Records for a couple years. They were definitely a thing in the local scene. Uh, Greg, I'm pretty sure, came in like third or fourth for Homecoming King, even though he was just like, he was very well liked, but he wasn't like a football player or anything like that. He was known as the dude who played in this band. And they opened for a lot of really legit national acts who came through New Jersey. And they opened for Paramore a bunch of times. When Paramore was on tour for their first album, All We Know Is Falling. And yeah, I remember. So I, I would like drive Pat to like to like hang out with people. And he, he, he like all this stuff about... <laughs> He would tell me, like, yo, well, first he told me about Paramore, but, like, way before the album came out, because I didn't know about them. And then, like, all the stuff about Haley, like, not being, or being the only one on the label, and the other guys being in the band, like, that's, like, has been, like, so much of this discussion now, like, gone through so many times, all the nonsense with that, but, like, he told me that back in, like, 05, it was like, dude, never tell anyone this, and I never did, but... <laughs> So I knew all this intrigue about the band, but also he loved them. Like, he got to be good buds with Hallie. So the, me and my group of friends would, like, be playing, uh, like, rock band in someone's living room. And Greg would just duck out and then be on the phone with Hallie for, like, 45 minutes or an hour plus talking about touring. Just like, oh, Greg's on the phone with Hallie. And at this point, they, she wasn't yet a celebrity, but, she, but Paramore was big within the scene. This is like 06, maybe a little into 07, we're talking, and 05. So yeah, just like seeing my friend do something like that, that was a lot of what made me realize like, oh, someone like me can, you know, write about music or work in the music industry. That's really exciting. And I love that, like, I don't know, that kind of like hometown pride, I guess, where you're like, this this scene just feels so inherently like familiar to me and I and you're immersed in it and it's not until you look back and you're like whoa that was kind of cool um I think a lot about the celebrity aspect of it too where it's like when I was younger I used to be so starstruck and get so excited about celebrities and now I'm like Honestly, they're just like people who did stuff and like everyone is kind of a person who does stuff and, um, and you know, whatever kind of, right. But like any kind of meaning you want to assign to it, you can. Um, I mean, I think a recent, um, example of this where I was like, you know what, a person's just kind of like a person, but I'm super happy for you is last summer I went to go see dashboard confessional and andrew mcmahon and if i'm talking about any kind of 2000s i mean yeah i guess emo but like the poppier side of it like those two were my absolute favorite dark blue is my myspace song hands down was in my aim away message and to see them together at the same show was like extremely fulfilling for me and i went by myself i'm like at the Oakdale Theater in Connecticut, sitting sitting there, drinking liquid death, eating Skittles. And I realize his, so Chris Caraba's Connecticut, like family, you know, before he Mm. really um, emerged on the scene in Florida, uh, he was originally from Connecticut and his family was sitting in front of me. And I was like, oh my God, technically, if I just sat here a little bit longer 
And also, I feel like I'm not someone who would look like super suspicious waiting. But if I waited longer, oh, I would meet him and and whatever. And I was like, you know what? I had a great experience. I'm going to go home. I did actually have a meet and greet uh, pass or whatever because they I got VIP tickets. But because it was it was last summer, so it was still when when the pandemic was in a phase of like, okay, we can go back out on tour, but if anybody gets sick, we're going to lose so much money. We mm. can't take any risks. And so it was like a group meet and greet, but I still thought it was so interesting how, and you mentioned Chris and Chris is in your book quite a bit. Like when you were with him, and again, I'm in a group of 50 people. It wasn't like I talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. He does make you feel like the only person in the room. He is also just sidebar, very good looking, but like he just has this presence that is so compelling and captivating. And even to kind of like see that come across in your book, I thought was so cool. Yeah. Chris speaks so slowly and succinctly. I'm kind of trying to do it now. <laughs> Caraba impersonation, if you will. But no, he he's so kind and so thoughtful that you almost wonder, like, is this for real? Like, is this like an, an act? But like from, you know, he was so generous with his time. The stuff that's in the book comes from two long interview sessions. I think both were about three hours over Zoom. He was so generous with his time and so I got to talk to him for so long and also once we did a podcast when I was at Billboard um at the Fueled by Ramen offices or Atlantic Record offices uh so from spending some time with him it's like no this persona is real this person is just very uniquely kind and thoughtful and also has an incredible memory in just incredible memory that's amazing. Was there anyone that you you interviewed for your book that you just felt like you you were almost surprised at like some kind of insight that you gleaned or you're like, "Wow, I got some amazing insight from this person that I wasn't necessarily expecting." Hmm. One, okay, one, one who just came to mind right away, who's kind of a unique first for the book, is Cassidy Pope. So before she won The Voice, she was in this Fueled by Ramen pop punk emo band called Hey Monday. Mm -hmm. who put out an album called Hold On Tight, which I thought was going to be huge. It's like the song Homecoming kind of had a moment on pop radio, but it didn't really catch on. And she was off to The Voice and had success in the country world after that. But I was super psyched to chat for her because actually uh, Christian McKnight, who uh, is also a person in my book a lot, who threw a lot of shows back then, he did a great interview with her that actually inspired me to uh, reach out to her. But she, basically she hadn't been full, full time in the thick of Hey Monday for a while. She's a solo artist now. So I wasn't sure like how willing she'd be able to like go in the weeds of like, what it was like it being signed so young and doing so much press. Like she, she was even, I think I, I want to say she was even younger than like most of the Paramore members when, when Hey Monday started. I think she was like 15 when they started working on her debut album. So I'm thinking like, this is someone who's been press trained for more than half her life. It's so sick to talk to her, but like, what, you know, how much is she going to open up? But she was one of the most self-aware people I spoke to for the whole book in terms of, like, being able to process what she went through and, like, tell me the stories about, like, yeah, we we had to do so many meet and greets that are, like, or, like, I, I wanted to do more meet and greets, but, like, my voice was always so blown out from having to just belt at the top of my range for all these songs because that's kind of where, like, people were pushing me, you know? So she was able to recount the stories but also put things into context for the present day and kind of the way that you and I talk about culture. She went really deep and was like, yeah, you know, my fans, I love my fans and a lot of them have stayed loyal, but 
I asked her, like, you know, why do you think the Hey Monday album didn't blow up the way it could have? And she was like, you know what? I think because we were kind of pushed to rush into things too quickly and just go to pop radio right away with our single. Whereas bands like Fall Out Boy and Paramore, they waited an album to really go all out with working their songs to radio and MTV. They kind of let the grassroots fan base come first. And Cassidy was like, yeah, looking back, I think the bands that really blossomed in the scene were bands that had that combination of the grassroots fan base for being like an indie local band for a while and then came to the pop kids. So I was like, wow, Cassidy's doing like some cultural criticism here alongside chatting about her band. So that interview really sticks out. I was, I was really psyched to get Cassidy into the book. That's amazing. How You Love Me Now is in my regular rotation on my, probably my favorite Spotify playlist to 2005 and beyond. And so for me, I think so much, there were really multiple waves in my own personal music discovery because I grew up on Queen and Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and live. And it wasn't until 97 when it's Spice Girls and Celine Dion and Backstreet Boys and who I discovered myself for the first time. Kind of the second wave of that was Dashboard Confessional and Jack's Mannequin and getting to truly discover my own music and refine my own musical tastes. So I'm interested in how you discovered music when you were younger, if there was kind of what that integration looked like of like, oh, being in a local area where it was possible to go see shows in person and hear about things via word of mouth in a way that maybe was not possible in the Midwest. Um, and then also, yeah, what bands you felt like, okay, this feels like mine. Yeah. Looking back, I feel just so lucky to have grown up where I did in Jersey at that era. Like I said, 02 to 06 was my high school years. Like in 05, I saw My Chemical Romance and Fall Out Boy so many times. So Aside from Warp Tour coming through, Warp Tour came through New Jersey twice. It came through like the northern area of New Jersey. It was at a place called English Town Raceway back then. But it also came through the South Jersey, Philly, Trenton area. There was also Taste of Chaos Tour, which came through. It was its first year was 05, so that came through in like January. Um then there was also Skate and Surf Fest, which happened every year in Asbury Park. And in 05, they changed the name to Bamboozle. And then in 06, Bamboozle moved to the parking lot at Giant Stadium in the Meadowlands. So that was always the last weekend of April into May. So similar to Warp Tour, but even more scene emo stuff from my book focus than Warp Tour, which was still a little bit more 90s punk. So like I saw Fall Out Boy and My Chemical Romance the same weekend twice in like three months in 2005 and this shit wasn't even expensive like Warp Tour back then if you like went to a record store like I remember Vintage Vinyl which is like unfortunately just closed a couple years ago but it was like this legendary record store in North Jersey you could just buy tickets there you know swerve a lot of the extra fees I think Warp Tour was like 30 something dollars back then and it's crazy now to think like oh five and this was and this was actually any kid in America. Like the warp tour went to Bozeman, Montana and like Nampa, Idaho that year. So it was all over. But any kid could have seen like Fall Out Boy, Paramore, My Chemical Romance, uh The Transplants with Travis Barker, uh All American Rejects, Hawthorne Heights, uh Silverstein, Under Oath, Thrice, like so many big bands for like thirty four dollars. This is crazy to think about now. But Jersey really, especially that part of Jersey, like I mentioned, Vintage, vintage Vinyl, the record store, they had a, uh, an album release show for Black Parade that had to be moved outside into the parking lot because just so many more people showed up. It probably sold out instantly, but still more people showed up than they could handle. So we were so privileged that we had so much stuff popping in that small area without even going into the city. So if you could get a ride from one of your friends, even if you just knew someone who was a couple years older or someone whose like older sibling had a car, you could get to this stuff. 
and just be able to experience all of this music that was so driving culture at that time. It's just so, it's being able to like actually like look back on things, you know, from all my time, like writing about music, writing about all kinds of music and just like reading books and shit. Like it's so unique to look back on. Mm -hmm. Something I thought was extremely cool was in your newsletter, you had posted about, I call it my physical media renaissance. Um, But yeah, you still have a bunch of um, ticket stubs and whatnot. And so I'm really interested in how you feel like having physical media, whether or just like yeah, physical media, memorabilia, mementos, whatever you want to call it. Like, how do you feel like having something tangible uh, affects or reinforces your memory? Or do, or are you okay with not having everything be physical? Yeah, I was a big saver back then, which like in retrospect was like absolutely the best move because... Like you said, that Substack post, that was so much fun to just go back. I, it's it's still like in this um old Converse shoebox I have where I would just like save all the flyers that I got or all the samplers, little like pins and buttons that I got from shows. So actually I'll show it here because it's a uh, multimedia podcast, but this one right here, this blue Panic at the Disco flyer with a very funny Pete Wentz quote on it. This I got at Bamboozle 2005 in the end of April, which was uh, five months before Fever even came out. I don't. I didn't even like realize it at the time what it was, because I think Panic started to really get hype online a couple months after that. But yeah, I rediscovered that flyer going through my stuff in that shoebox maybe in like 2015 and I was like oh shit this is so cool and I've like searched on Google images and stuff and I've never seen that before definitely other people have it I'm sure because you know they were just handing out stacks of them photocopied at bamboozle but yeah being able to get that into the photo section of the book and also just have so much stuff to be able to check dates because for the for the book trying to find, like, oh, what were the dates for this uh, Silverstein Fallout Boy tour in 2004? Most of that's just not online anymore because Mm -hmm. this was really before a lot of, like, the new internet where it was sites that still exist today, basically. Um, So much of this was on sites that just don't exist anymore. So being able to hang on to physical media (laughs) helped out when you're writing a book like this. Definitely. It's actually very funny you mentioned with the dates because, like I mentioned, raised on Led Zeppelin, my dad is the foremost Led Zeppelin researcher, at least based out of the U.S. And he uh, and Dave Lewis, who's written a ton of Led Zeppelin books, came out with actually two editions of every single one of their shows. There's pictures of ticket subs, posters, exterior shots of venues it's so incredibly detailed and thorough and I could just go to my dad and what's you know any day of the week any day of the year I could be like what happened what's give me like my Led Zeppelin what happened today in history fact and he could just spit it right out and so I think that that being the person who raised me explains a lot yeah my dad's the same way with he's a Beatles dad first and foremost but also like a Dylan and like old folk like uh, Pete Seeger Arlo Guthrie dad yeah was that your first music influence and how influenced were you by your dad's music taste because again until I was seven I didn't listen to anything on the on like pop music radio was only rock Yeah, my first experience of getting into music was the Beatles when I was, like, kindergarten age. And, yeah, my dad showed it to me. I just, I mean, I loved the movies. Yeah, Magical Mystery Tour, just, like, from the the cartoon, um, I didn't even, like, realize that the Beatles were, well, I knew they were people. But, like, I I didn't even, like, really think of them as, like, people who existed in the world. I just thought of them as, like, characters who made music which is probably because I before that the way I 
perceived music was like the Lion King and like like Simba singing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So just and just like how catchy those songs are, and like some of the songs, like you know, Yellow Submarine is basically a children's song. Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> the Beatles was the first thing for me. And then it did take me a long time to get back into, like, older music. Because, honestly, I wasn't that much of a music person until I just got super into, like, the emo stuff. Like, I was just, like, a sports kid who was really into, like, playing football and street hockey. And, like, collecting baseball cards. And it really was just, like... the kids around me like like I said like by my friend Greg who was in the band just in high school like coming into this new group of kids who were kind of like a cross section of the kids who were in like all the honors and AP classes with me but the ones in that group who also went to shows who like didn't just like study on the weekends and also there was a little cross section with like um like, uh, like the theater kids, which was also kind of a cool thing in my school was like really popular. Like I remember like people from the football team were like in the, the big, like the, like each year's big show for like the theater program, which everyone thought was cool. But yeah, so I came into the music really through like this group of high school friends. And I just was like for a few years, just like this annoying, pretentious scene kid looking back who was just like my entire iPod just would have been bands that get covered in alternative press. Like, that was pretty much it. And then it wasn't until, like, a couple years, probably, like, sophomore year of college, where I started to come back around to a lot of my dad's music, and uh, Spring Scene was the first one for that. And, like, going to see the Magic Tour, that was uh, 2007 with my dad. And we just, as a family, went and saw a Bruce Spring Scene last month, and Springsteen is one of my favorites, but yeah, now I've, I've come full circle on the music stuff, but it really did take um, a few years of being just like intense Jersey scene kid to get that out of my system and come back around to other stuff. Yeah, I grew up dancing. Dance was my whole life. And so m- music is kind of like inextricably tied to that. And so you're always listening to new music and discovering new music. And when you're Gen X, dance teacher has an obsession with Janet Jackson. You go down the Janet Jackson rabbit hole and, you know, things evolve in that way. And I remember even in sixth grade, you know, why I made one of my best friends because we both love the Beatles. And we're like, how random is that? That two 11 year old girls favorite band bands are queen and the Beatles. And that was something I could always bond with her over. And I think I was definitely known as that person who could use music as a way to relate to people and communicate with people in a way that kind of how you were talking about with like the homecoming queen and king set of of high school people. I was never in that group, but I was very much somebody people knew because I could like maybe I would see you at a random show or maybe I would, you know, see you at the ice cream parlor downtown or whatever, just like being someone who's there and and music is just like such a easy and fun way to connect and communicate. Yeah. The first thing I really remember with what we've been talking about here with like what you said with now nostalgia and stuff coming back around. I remember being in elementary school in the late nineties And that was when, like, the whole Woodstock late 60s hippie stuff was coming around again. I remember, like, kids my age wearing bell bottoms and, Mm -hmm. like, reading these... My my parents would be like, oh, the kids your age, they're getting into our music. And I was like, shut up, Mom. Yeah, Yeah, I was like... (laughs) But I... And, like... Like, I remember going to see, like, the Brady Bunch movie that came out in the 90s. I guess that was 70s, but... The, the like the Brady Bunch movie, the new one that came out in the nineties with my family, and I guess back then it just took a lot longer for things to come around because that was like the thirtieth or so anniversary of Woodstock. Yeah, I constantly talk about this micro trend called 
Grooveival. And so it was essentially the revival of hippie and flower power 60s into 70s culture from the vantage point of the 90s, meaning that it lacked that socio-political context in the way that, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, everything was highly politicized and it was an entire movement. Whereas in the 90s, it was like, I wore bell bottoms, I wore tie-dye shirts, I had a hippie themed birthday party, I was a hippie for Halloween, and I was the Delia's catalog epitomized. But like, that's what it was. And, and it's been funny because I used to be like, oh, mom, you're so annoying. But she continues to do it. I think now it's funny when when clothes that really feel like me are in particular silhouettes, like a wide leg pant or a flare, like when those kind of things come back into style. It's so funny because whether it was when I was nine years old or now in my 30s, my mom's like, you dress like I did when I was a teenager. And I'm like, that's, it, it's, it's part of her and that she lived through the 70s but then it was a part of me because I lived through the 90s and now it's this this cycle has repeated itself and it's the first time that people in our age group are old enough to see this entire movement and now as we're seeing with 2000s nostalgia we're like whoa whoa whoa, whoa. we are not old enough for this but anything that's 20 years or older is vintage. So if Abercrombie wants to come out with vintage lace camis, I'm not mad at it. Um, but I have a question for you. Did you shop at Hot Topic? For sure, yeah. So I kind of like tried to like toe the line between scene kid and like polo shirts like I, I worked at american eagle that was one of my first jobs i worked at the american eagle in woodbridge mall so i don't know what i was trying to do at that i was very um, delusional at that age like I, I i would i would wear like polo shirts with the collars popped i would do that shit but also wear like like a studded belt uh like like um, buckled on the side, like the white belt from Hot Topic. Yeah. And uh, I was like big into black Converse. I went to Hot Topic a lot for the band shirts. Mm -hmm. Like I had like a big, like I have curly hair, so I couldn't really do like much of anything as far as like scene kid hair. So I kind of leaned into people like, Kenny from the starting line who had just like the big curly fro and did that with my hair. So I had just like big curly hair at that age. And I was like a, I was like a band shirts guy. A lot of band shirts from Hot Topic. There was, there was a sh an Academy is shirt, a green Academy is shirt with clouds on it. Kind of like a seventies logo. I wore the hell out of that shirt. Um, the, the, the Fall Out Boy is for Lovers shirt. That was another group. I wore a lot of green shirts back then. Mm -hmm. That was a thing for me for some reason. So, yeah, the, I was all about the Hot Topic t-shirt wall. And also mixed in a lot of polos. And, uh, yeah, I really try to do this mix of, like, preppy and emo, I guess. Which, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I used to get a lot of band shirts from Hot Topic or from Delia's or just general graphic tees. And I would maybe wear a, like a, um, what do you call it? Like a waffle, long sleeve, like waffle shirt with thumb holes underneath it. Mm -hmm. Something, something to that effect. But I was always very kitschy in everything, like a matching earring with a matching necklace with a matching shoelace on my converse you know things of that nature but I bring it up because I had a very nostalgic moment there last summer in that they I did a buy online pick up in store order because they had a Spice Girls t-shirt so I'm like oh God. the fact that I'm buying a Spice Girls t-shirt from Hot Topic in 2022 was already just kind of funny but then when I go in the store and I go to pick it up there's the music playing, obviously. And cute with without the E comes on. And you hear that one, one first note at the beginning. 
And I just look around. It's like this immediate knee jerk reaction. And I look around to be like, oh my God, guys, like it's our song. Like who's who's here? Who's ready? Who I could literally climb on the counter and start like belting this right. And I will start swinging a microphone around and like, no, I mean, there were only a few other people in the store, but they were all teenagers. And so I don't know if they didn't know the song or they didn't recognize it, or they just don't have unbridled enthusiasm the same way that I do, but I thought that was so, so funny. And something that um, I wanted to bring up too that you had mentioned recently was like, where now? I think that this is something kind of confusing to millennials, right? Where it's like, we used the internet when it was still so new and novel to find out information that I feel like we had this insatiable curiosity for knowledge where and or maybe it's just a personality type I don't know but it's like if I find out about a band I don't just stream them on Spotify like I will go on their Wikipedia I will go on some random message board like I will try to find out every single possible possible thing that I can and you know I think a lot about now how platforms are democratized so so many people have direct access to their favorite artists in a way that we maybe didn't until MySpace. That was maybe like the earliest example of it. But, you know, people weren't as accessible back then. And so now people kind of tend to take everything at face value, maybe because they assume that if Haley Williams wants to share anything, she can and she will. What do you think about that perception of like, you know, fans in relation to the artists and people doing their due diligence about fans and people that they're interested in. Yeah. Well, I think you you were, you were seeing out that stuff because you were cool. I mean, and I think there's cool people who will go deep no matter what era it is. Now, I mean, now is interesting. (laughs) I kind of feel like there's this funny connection between zoomers and boomers now where like, Anything they see on a screen, they're like, oh, that's the news. Whereas we, we came of age where it was like, you learned what like the news was because like you saw the internet in its earliest forms and you're just like, oh, anyone can post anything here. I can, I, 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 I knew what it was like to see my parents just watch the news on TV when there was like, no, like when there, before there was like Instagram or TikTok. So like, I know the difference. So it's like, I think it's harder for boomers because they're so used to there just being like a few channels. And like, if you see something on like CBS News at five o'clock, well, that's on a screen. That's the news. And like, okay, like I'm logging into like my homepage on like yahoo.com. Okay, here's the news. It's just like, That's it. Like anything is on a screen is the news because parents aren't used to like Instagram or TikTok. Most of them are. And now it's this thing where I feel like maybe it's just because like all they teach in schools is fucking STEM and like no one learns anything about like English or media or history. But it's just like, oh, a hot person with X amount of followers is saying this on TikTok. Oh, that's that's like a law. That's 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 the news that happened. So. Boomers and Zoomers, I think, kind of are like that interlocking meme with like the two the two strong arms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think in like in like I don't know what the thing would be. Any hot hot person on screen says thing must be true. Mm-hmm. That's that's boomers and zoomers. That is so interesting. And I, I think a lot about media literacy and the lack thereof, actually, and so many issues that we had. This isn't specific to millennials. It goes back to boomers and everybody, but especially with like diet culture and beauty industry psyops, like we've been fed these messages, whether it's through billboards or magazines or television, like insert mass media distribution channel here but um you'd like to think that things get better as time progresses and that if we like quote know better we do better but um that's not true (laughs) and it's really interesting to see uh as media evolves and as 
fandom evolves, like how people behave. Yeah, because once you get to a certain point, because you were saying like artists, how like they just have their platform and they can just go on and say whatever. And for a lot of people, like that's it. Like that's the truth. Um, You know, in some ways it's really good that artists just like, you know, have more agency to like not have to go through certain platforms and channels to just like get their story out there. You know, when when some artist is talking about how, like, the major label they just signed to won't release their song for the past eight months because they're trying to manufacture a viral TikTok moment. I think it's awesome that artists can just post that and be like, yo, this is what's happening. But, um, yeah, I think, like, our generation is, like, really unique. And this isn't to, like, credit us because no one can control where they're born. But, like, being, like being born at a time where you like went to the library and like searched through the physical card catalog at schools and then learned how to use Google in real time as it was being started and then like did MySpace and then like oh Tumblr is the thing now like oh okay now Twitter I guess Twitter is the thing and like learning each thing one by one in real time getting a chance to do that is pretty unique you know that can't really happen unless you were born in like the late 80s early 90s what was your myspace song i had so many uh i mean like i definitely had where are your boys or uh, grand theft autumn Mm -hmm. uh oh man i had so i switched it so i think i think a census fail buried a lie i had a lot you you would always try to have something that was a little under the radar because it was like I'm sure tons of people had, like, Sugar Were Going Down or Helena, but especially, like, with the people I ran with in Jersey, that would have seemed a little basic. So yeah. you wanted to have, like, your, a local band. So, yeah, my, my friend Greg, who the who was friends with Haley, his band Moraine, uh, M-O-R-A-I-N-E, if anyone wants to look that up, they had a song called Smirnoff In My Smile. That song was, like, the jam from, like, the first EP that they did after my friend joined the band. So I definitely had, like, their songs from, like, 05, 06 on my page. And uh, I feel like a lot of the songs I really associate with MySpace were kind of novelty songs in in some way. Like, I have such a memory of Gym Class Heroes' Taxi Driver because, you know, emo rap at the time was, like, it was such a novel thing. Like, and Travi and that song shouting out so many, like, seminal emo post-hardcore bands and the lyrics was such a cool thing and also hey there delilah was so many people's myspace song because i mean obviously there was dashboard but still like an acoustic ballad was kind of a novelty thing back then i actually remember hey there delilah from like whenever it came out whenever right when it came out was I remember it from then, from MySpace. And then it didn't hit the radio and the mainstream until maybe like a year or two later. And I remember then hearing it on the radio and being like, isn't this song like old? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. It was just, I I don't know the whole story behind Hey There Delilah. (laughs) I get, now I'm compelled to find out. I (laughs) say, I literally go down a rabbit hole each and every day about something different because I always have that curiosity and approach things with that excitement. And it's like not saying that it's going to be at a trivia night or question or anything, but still interesting to know. And I love that sense of, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase it other than like the hipster urge where you're just like, I crave information and newness and intrigue and I know that the other people who are ahead of the curve in some way are right here with me too yeah yeah I'm glad you bring up hey there Delilah and like trying to (laughs) dig deeper um it's in the book I I chatted with uh Tom and Zamar from Plain White Tees they tell like in an I think the the first time they mention it is a chapter in the book called New Friend Request, which is which takes place in like 04 into 05 a little bit. The song came out in 05 and it became a Billboard number one Hot 100 song. They're the only band in the whole book that has that, which is 
That's a trivia question. Wow. But, um, yeah, it became a number one song, I want to say in 08, or I think late 07. It was 07. Mm-hmm. So it took like a full two years, and on a, a, they were already on a different album cycle by the time uh, Hey There Delilah was number one. Um, and this song finally resurfaces in the book in a chapter about like panic at the disco, putting out pretty odd and like Ryan Ross leaving the band. It's like 15 chapters later. And that's when, uh, Hey There Delilah became number one. So I considered in my early proposal, there was a whole chapter on that on Hey There Delilah. Uh, as I dug into the story, it's, 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 it's interesting in the fact of like that it took so long and it was such a novel hit. The actual story itself was like kind of a mix of cringe and boring. So I was like, <laughs> make the best for a chapter. Uh, and also because it was just spread over so many years, it didn't really fit into the books. The whole book is uh, chronological. So it took so much time, a chapter on just, hey, there, Del- Delilah, it didn't quite work. Yeah, if I had to guess the years, I would have said 05 to 07 because I particularly remember the people that I was around when it came out. And I was like, I am so much cooler than these people who just think that this song came out today. But, you know, that's kind of the the joys of music discovery, right? Um, Okay, I could literally talk to you for the rest of my life, but I want to thank you for coming on the show. Tell the people where they can find you and your book. Yeah, so uh, my Twitter handle is at cpayne on a plane, C P A Y N E O N A P L A N E. It is a reference to the great Cobra Starship song. It started off as an aim away message that I made in my bedroom in 2006. And it's basically just followed me ever since. So at CPAN on Plane on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, have a sub stack called Save to Drafts. And uh, the book right here, Where Are Your Boys Tonight? Uh, wherever books are sold, out now. Yay! Thank you again for being on the show. Thank you everyone for listening. And we will see you next time. Bye. That's a wrap for this week. If you like Nostalgia, connect with me on social at Nicole Tremaglio. Subscribe to the Nostalgia newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com and follow, rate, and review on your platform of choice. Everything's linked in the show notes, including where to find out more about our guest of the week. Thank you so, so much for your support. And that was this week's episode of Nostalgia. Nostalgia.